Hey, what's up? It's Dave from I'mSimplyAdad.com, and you're watching the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. I am excited to welcome Dr. Dana Cohen to the show today. Dr. Dana, welcome to the Happy Healthy Family Podcast. Thank you for having me. Now, Dr. Dana is an integrative medical doc. Uh, she trained under the famous Dr. Robert Atkins, you know, who, of course, created uh, or one of the first people to popularize the, the ketogenic diet, which back then was called Atkins, of course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I guess, you know, that probably molded you in a specific direction working under someone like that. And you've become sort of an expert now on the topic of water and and optimal hydration. And so, of course, you wrote the book, uh, Quench, which was an outstanding read. And I've told you this several times. <laughs> but uh, in the book, she presents sort of a, you know, a really practical approach, you know, an everyday approach to sort of nourishing and making sure our body actually gets hydrated and the water we're drinking gets to where it needs to be. And uh, I got to say, I took... I think it was like 12 pages of notes as I was as I was uh, writing, and I had a Google Doc open as I was uh, reading the book, and I would just jot down a question as it popped in my head, and I ended up with two pages of questions. So <laughs> I can't really, I can't wait to dive in. I'm ready. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk, discuss the, you know the fundamental ideas on how to properly hydrate and make sure the water you drink gets to where it needs to be. But uh, I really recommend you guys uh, go out and buy this book. It, it was a I found it fascinating, but maybe I'm just a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so anyway, so let's let's go ahead and, and sort of start with the basics. So we all know, you know, hydration is important. But, um, you know, other than avoiding dehydration or like heat stroke, like what exactly does water do for us that we would even need to worry about sort of optimal hydration? Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you for that introduction. I, I'm very <laughs> proud of the book too. And, and I just, it's not even for the nerds. It really is. It's written for the masses and it's written in, in a really easy to understand. But I also think that people say, oh, I know everything about hydration. I know I need to drink more water, um, but it's so much more than that. And I think what, you know, the point, the, the big point that we're trying to make is that we are all affected by this sort of day in and day out chronic low grade dehydration and like you said it's not the kind of uh dehydration where you're in a you know need iv fluids in a hospital um but it's something that affects almost all of us and i i even know for myself when like i'm i'm i'm, I'm by the beach right now and yesterday or the night before two days ago I didn't do well at hydrating myself and I woke up at four o'clock in the morning with a splitting headache and I just knew it and I couldn't, and I was like, I know better and I need to do better. And it was just, you know, that one day, but it's that day upon day, every day that layers upon us that I really believe that this chronic low grade dehydration is the first step in preventing and treating chronic illness. So, um, hydration is, um, the, the first and foremost, it's it's the baseline of all homeostasis or balance in the body and at a cellular level. So um, we need hydration for our cells to be properly hydrated and balanced. And that's how disease is prevented. Basic. So what do you mean by balance? So um, we need fluid in our cells to balance things like electrolytes and um, electrolytes are sodium and potassium. Um, and, and it's, that's, it's hard to say in a nutshell what that word is homeostasis. So it's that there's, there's no better word for it except balance. Um, when we have disease or there's inflammation, even we need proper hydration for, for, for our, um, our cells to move the, 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 um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, the factors that fight that inflammation is within our cells, and and we need that proper hydration with everything from inflammation to detoxification, to cancer prevention and fighting cancer and fighting infection. So so that's what I mean by balance. When we're out of balance is when disease happens. Right. And so with that, the water sort of important for, you know, the strength of your immune system, sort of anti-aging, anti-cancer sort of thing. And, and you know, it obviously sort of one of the um, 
uh, early signs of that low grade dehydration you talked about was like the sort of brain fog or like the reduced, you know, the afternoon drag that we all get when we reach for coffee, which by the way, in the book, you say that we can still drink coffee and up to four cups is not dehydrating. So hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> well, let me, let me clarify up to four cups is not a diuretic. Okay. So yes. Um, so yes, we can drink coffee, but it, I also just like to tell people, you know, if I drink two cups of coffee, I get the jitters, you know, and caffeine has an effect on us as well. So you, you I think the single thing that we, I, I try to stress when I talk about the book too, is if I can teach a person how to recognize what optimal hydration feels like or, or, um, or what too much caffeine feels like in their body or what it's doing to their stress levels, if I can empower you to help yourself that I've done my job. And that's what we try to do in the book is to teach you what it feels like to be properly hydrated and feel terrific. And, and yeah, I just want to go back. It's important that, um, I think the first sign of this chronic low grade dehydration is probably that, that afternoon fatigue or brain fog. So, you know, we think, Oh, you're thirsty. Therefore you're dehydrated. If you're thirsty, it's your, your, far gone already. You're too, you're already dehydrated, you know? So instead of thinking maybe my blood sugar has dropped in the afternoon, think maybe I'm dehydrated and instead of reaching for sugar, reach for, for hydration. Gotcha. So when you are, when you feel thirsty, it's already too late. So, yeah. so reach for that, you know, uh, lemon water or, you know, the, the homemade salt water that you're making, uh, before you get thirsty. Exactly, yeah. and then hopefully you don't actually get that uh, that afternoon drag. But yeah. um, if you are, then reach for the for the lemon or the salt water, right? Yeah, and we'll talk about um, so so. Let's just jump in and say the first thing that you could do to prevent that. One of the things we talk about in the book is um, front loading your water, meaning um, waking up and doing like sixteen ounces of a big glass of water throw a little sea salt in there for electrolytes and maybe a little squeeze of lemon for more minerals and more electrolytes. Um, that's how desert people hydrate. My co-author is uh, Gina Bria. She's an anthropologist and she did her dissertation on how desert people hydrate. And they certainly don't hydrate by drinking eight glasses of water a day, every yeah. day. And so, um, so front loading your water is a really good way to start the day. Yeah, there, there's a lot of really cool examples of how these these people in these extreme environments sort of stay hy hydrated without access to to the water. You know, the free, easy access that we have here. Uh, it's a, it's really fascinating. It's one of the, the things that was interesting about the book. Yeah, thank um, you. But let me ask: uh, when you front load your water, so what? When I try to do that, and, and I do try to do that, and I kind of ignore the the how it makes me feel. But so when I drink two glasses of water in the morning, it, it makes me feel bloated. And sometimes it makes me feel bloated for like, you know, two hours. So why is that? And, and what should you do if that's the case? Huh, that's really interesting. I, I, I don't hear that typically at all. Um, and, you know, it makes me wonder, well, what else is going on with you? you know, that, that you're feeling bloated. Um, what are you eating? What is, you know, what does the rest of your diet look like? What does the rest of your day look like? Are you moving? Why are you not able to, to, um, hold on to those electrolytes? You know, why are your cells sort of seeping out fluid if they are, you know, are you getting edema in your legs? Um, so I don't know specifically for you, but that's unusual. Um, I think maybe also, is it too much salt in your water? Are you putting too much, you know, I, I, it's hard to say. So I'm not, it's, it's not a typical thing um, by drinking that much water, but I would like to look at, you know, we could talk later, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would like, you know, look at you as a whole and what else is going on with you that, that makes you feel bloated. Gotcha. So. Okay. So that, that's just something that, uh, that is unique <laughs> to me and that means something else is going on, which, which I kind of already know. Mm. Um, that's good. So you're not cut off from the neck down. At least you're you're in tune with in touch with what's going on. So so, yeah, we can, you know, seriously, we can talk later if you want. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we so we talked about this, this sort of chronic low grade dehydration. And, and in the book, you talk about how it's sort of the epidemic behind all epidemics. So sort of what do you mean by so what is chronic low, low grade dehydration? I guess we can start with that. And what do you mean by it's the epidemic behind all epidemics? So, um, okay. 
So I think that before we address any kind of, um, di- or before we take on any kind of diet, um, or, you know, we have so many diets now that are addressing different, um, diseases. So like autoimmune diet, anti-inflammatory diet, before you take on any of those diets and, and, and there's so many different avenues that you can take. There's vegan, there's keto, and there's everything in between. Um, and we're looking, we're looking to prevent chronic illness. That's why people are taking on these, these new ways of life and lifestyle plans. I think the first step though, is you have to know how to hydrate properly before you, before you start anywhere. Um, for that, for that exact reason, I think that this low grade dehydration is the, um, the first step in treating and preventing chronic illness. I said it once, I'm going to say it again, and I will probably say it a few more times throughout the, the talk, because um, I think that's a really big, powerful statement that people don't, don't realize. And we take it for granted and nobody really, you know, even myself, the other two days ago, I didn't do a good enough job. And I know so much better that I woke up with a splitting headache at four o'clock in the morning, you know, um, and it wasn't from alcohol because I'm not, I'm not a big drinker. It was because I knew it, I knew it all day long too. And I still couldn't do anything about it. So, um, that first step is day in and day out. We need to, um, really focus on hydration as, um, as a first step. So let me ask you, since you brought it up again, so what did you do when you woke up with a splitting headache? Did you did you just reach for the salt water, or did you have a, like an electrolyte supplement, or what did you do? Yeah, so I um I keep a I keep I got a new water bottle. I just want to show you. I'm so happy. Oh, look at that! It's got your name on it. That's cool. <laughs> my cousin got me this, so I keep this by my bed. Um, I fill it at night before I go to bed, and usually I drink it first thing in the morning because that's my my front loading my water. Um, I woke up, I drank that, and I drank the whole thing because I just knew I wasn't you know, and I put, I do throw a little pinch of sea salt in there and some lemon. Um, I have also, I do have some electrolyte replacement. I use this one called Cure Hydration. Full disclosure, I am on the board of this company um, and it's a a really clean, wonderful product that has um, all the electrolytes in it. It tastes great, no sugar, um, really lovely product. So um, sometimes I'll use that, but I I just, I know I just needed water and um, I fell back to sleep and I woke up and I was fine. So I drank a ton of water. Excellent. So yeah. I think most people would like, you know, run to the medicine cabinet and grab, you know, you know, some type of a Tylenol or something like that, which yeah. you know, never really works that well. <laughs> I don't take Tylenol. It does nothing. <laughs> right. And it's, and it's like terrible for you really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me ask, so sort of, well, let me go back. So what are some of the, like the signs uh, of being dehydrated aside from, you know, brain fog and, you know, Fatigue. the headache image? Yeah. So, um, a good, uh, I, I like this test at home. So you want to look at the best way to see if you're dehydrated is you can look at the color of your urine. We want our urine to be pale straw colored, um, and our light yellow colored. Um, there's a caveat to that, which I always tell people, because if we take B vitamins, you know, our urine is neon yellow. Right. <laughs> so, so all, all bets are off with that. But um, if you don't and you want your, your urine to be a nice pale yellow colored, um, if it's bright yellow or orange, you're, it's very concentrated, you need to drink more water. Um, if it's crystal clear, you could be drinking too much water. And that happens. That's ha- used to happen to me a lot in the past, too. Um, I think I tell this story in the book where I... Uh, when I first started to do the research on hydration, I had a a conference in Las Vegas and I, um, I sat at a table and I said, I'm going to really hydrate myself because I, you know, I know now about hydration, like, (laughs) and there's water in front of everybody's desk at the, in, in the desert, literally in the desert, sitting in a big room under these horrible lights and you're sitting all day and you're expected to learn, you know, sit there for eight hours and learn from these speakers. It's actually grueling. Conferences are grueling. People don't realize how hard they are. And, um, and so I'm going to drink and I'm going to drink and I drank all this, I kept filling the pitcher and drinking all day long. And, um, all I would do is after every lecture, I'd get up, go to the bathroom. Um, and I still felt horrible by the end of the day. I was exhausted, like not thinking clearly after a few lectures, I was not getting any of the information and I was overhydrating. Um, cut to a few months later, I had a conference in Arizona that those people know how to hydrate. They, um, you know, I drank smoothies. They had, um, areas with, um, not lychee with, um, 
what's the a prickly pear, which mm-hmm. is a desert cactus. Um, so they would have these waters that were infused with prickly pear and and citrus, um, and I hydrated differently, and I absolutely noticed a difference. So my urine was now not crystal clear. I was think I was energized by the end of the day. I was thinking clearer. So, so that's one of the ways that you can just tell. Do you know? Do that's an N of one study, but try it because you will notice a difference. Yeah, I think yeah, it's an it's an energy and just basically so are, do you feel crappy? And if you do, then drink some water or some yeah. you know, have a handful of, of chia seeds that you mentioned in the book or, yeah. or you know a teaspoon of salt. <laughs> yeah. Not a teaspoon, and that's it, too much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, so if you feel better, then that's you know, you're dehydrated pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, we're meant to get up and urinate every two or three hours. So if, um, you know, I know I've sat at my desk for 10 hours straight working, seeing patients day, you know, without getting up once, um, that not good. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, we're meant to get up and pee every two or three hours. Um, another sign, um, what else? Muscle aches are sign can be a sign. Headaches we know about. Dry mouth, dry dry skin. All those are you're pretty far gone by that point too. But um, other signs of dehydration that you can look for. I feel like I'm missing a big one. Now, what about the the whole like pinching your your skin trick? Is that a good uh, metric? Like if it snaps back into place, then you, then you're you're okay but if it takes a second or two to to go back then that means you need some more water. Yeah, I mean I I think it's it's pretty good. Um it's 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 also not great because it depends on also, you know, how aged your skin is, that kind of thing. If you have dry, crepey skin, um yeah, I mean I definitely think you want to you want to um if you're young, definitely, you know, anywhere up to 50-ish or 60-ish even. Um, if your skin is very dry and crepey to begin with, um, then it's not the perfect thing. But basically, a, a good rule of thumb is you pinch the top of your hand, and if it tents and doesn't go back down like quickly, then try hydrating better and seeing if it makes a difference. Gotcha. Now everybody pinch your hand and see what happens. <laughs> Now, mine sprung back in because I had a little bit of electrolytes before we got on. I love it. I love it. Excellent. <laughs> and I'm actually drinking some more. I got some diluted cranberry with uh, with some uh, Seeking Health uh, electrolyte powder. Uh, we're going to talk about cranberry because I know you're going to ask that question. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'll talk about that once we get to your, your quench plane, I think. Okay. Uh, so back to uh, going to the bathroom. So. You said we're meant to go every three or four hours or every two to three? What was that? Two to three hours. Two it depends. You know, yeah. So I have always found that I go like way more than anyone else goes. And it doesn't matter if I'm drinking, you know, twice an hour, two bottles of water an hour, or if I'm drinking one bottle every four hours. I still go at least once an hour. It just depends on the, the you know, quantity, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so why why is that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that could, if you're literally peeing every hour that, you know, that could be the sign of something is not, is not right. You have a very small bladder. Is there something irritating it? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, everybody's different. We all make um, a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, where um, that, that hormone gets, um, it cycles. So it's higher in the nighttime so Mm -hmm. that we don't pee at night. We also, as we get older, we lose that hormone. Um, everybody's different. So it's, you know, I, I don't, it's hard to say, but I would also really take a look at, um, how much fiber you're getting because fiber holds on to water. You know, if you do the plan, you're having some green smoothies, using vegetables, using a lot of fiber. Um, I, often patients say they do notice a difference if they're not peeing as often when you're when you're doing more fiber based um smoothies and that kind of thing so it's holding on to the water like a sponge a little bit better and you you become a little more more uh cells become a little bit more hydrated so i also i wonder um again with you maybe at at the cellular level is there something that you're not quite doing right i'm not sure Gotcha. I'm, I wonder if it's the fiber because I, I don't do enough fiber. I mean, I, I eat a lot of veggies and, and things like that, but uh, I've historically have avoided fiber because I worry about it feeding uh, bad microbes. Yeah. Uh, is, is that accurate? Is that something to worry about or am I over worrying? Uh, I, well, it depends. Um, 
It can. Um, I think, you know, if you have something like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, you do have to be a little careful of fiber. Um, so you got to figure out a way to treat that first and then, and then work up to tolerance and what you can tolerate with fiber. I think it's important that we, we do get fiber in our diets. And I think with all the um, keto dieters that um, that's becoming a little bit of a problem. Um, if, especially if they're not doing it right, you know, if there's no vegetables, you know, people are avoiding and all they're eating is protein. The carnivore um, diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and by the way, a very dehydrating diet, um, it's a known diuretic. So you have to up your water content like way more than, than even what I'm telling you to do. If you are on one of those kind of dehydrating diets and those are dehydrating, they're good. And I believe in, in, in many of them. Um, but you need to be a little careful with hydration. So. Okay. Yeah. So let's go ahead and, and talk about some of the, some foods that sort of, uh, dehydrate us or, or you know, and create that imbalance you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So processed food. Um, and I think it's, it's really all about what kind of energy your body has to take use to process that food, to, um, to get it through your system. Um, so processed food is, is a big one. Um, dehydrating foods are, I think, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to label anything as dehydrating, you know, except, except I could say most processed food because of the way the body has to utilize it. Um, do you have any specific questions about specific uh, food? Well, I can... wondered about, well, a couple of things I wondered about. Number one is, is like coconut flour. Like you put a tiny amount of coconut flour when you're baking something and it just like dries up automatically. So yeah. does it sort of have the same effect as we digest it or, or is it completely uh, no. different? No, I think it's completely different. Um, you know, so I'm going to give you an example that maybe can, uh, you can visualize it. So cauliflower is actually very hydrating, even though it's so dry and there's nothing to it, but there's, there's water, there is water in there. There's things that are, you know, so like the same goes for coconut flowers and those kind of things, even though it's a dry food, um, it's not necessarily dehydrating. You know, it does, it, because, uh, you know, there's fiber in that too. So it does pull water. Um, it pulls water into, into the lumen of your intestines, into your, into your, into your stomach. But, um, and in that sense, it may be a little, it's, it's not the right question to ask though. I was going to say in that sense, it may be a little bit dehydrating, but the, the truth is we need water you know, um, so the, 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 the book, the quench book is not telling us not to drink water. Um, and it, and it, even though we are, we are emphasizing eating your water, we still need water. There's three things we need for energy. We need water, we need greens and we need light, um, in the form of, of sunshine or UV light and that, that kind of thing, which we'll talk about. I know that's on your list of questions. Yeah. And so the, the before we move on, the other question or the other food was uh, sort of sugar. Like, how does you know eating a high sugar food, even if it's like a natural, you know, I don't know, maple syrup or, or a spoonful of honey or you know an orange or something like that? Yeah, Which, you of know, of course, those are probably all different because the orange has fiber, you know. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think we also we have to have some sugar in our diet, some carbohydrate in our diet. Um, there is interesting um, theories about how how sugar how sugar um, works with uh, insulin and um, and the the whole process how it pulls water um, into into the cell in order to, for the cell to to process the sugar. So I think high sugar diets um, do use more water from that sense, but um, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in just a, like a little nutshell, it's hard to say, oh, that's a, you know, honey is a dehydrating food. Not necessarily. It's also a demulcent. So it pull, it does give sort of gel um, structure to the water as well. But it, if, if I had to, it's, it's so hard to sort of um, put a big label on it, you know, um, it, unless you're eating tons of sugar all day long, that kind of thing, it's a, it's a problem. It's not necessarily a problem for everybody in small amounts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you an, an example and see if, uh, you yeah. know, something sort, or you can tell us, uh, what happened. So my son who is, 
my neurotypical son, uh, not my son with autism. He okay. is 10, and we went. We were at the beach last week on vacation, and we found a, a local organic bakery that had gluten-free treats. And so, you know, we're on vacation, so we got a, uh, a treat, and he ate this, this big old peanut butter, sh- you know, sugar cookie. And then we went to the beach for about an hour or two and this was probably five o'clock at night so it wasn't like in the heat of the the day or anything but then when we got back he felt awful and so i suspected that you know that cookie sort of contributed to you know imbalance of electrolytes you know the sugar pulled water and you know he was just he got super crabby and he said his stomach hurt and he he, his head hurt and he didn't want to eat he didn't want to drink Mm-hmm. And then I gave him some of my Seeking Health electrolytes, which he didn't want to drink, but he did. So I gave him just like a little tiny bit of water, you know, because it would be easier for him to to power down the electrolyte powder because it, you know, it doesn't taste good for, especially for a kid. But he drank it, and then within three minutes, he came and smacked me in the back of the head, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> "I guess you're feeling better." And he just smiled. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So I mean, I guess just you know, with that you know, example, it just said, you know, yes, he was dehydrated because he took those electrolytes and then he was perfectly fine. Like the rest of the night, he was in a good mood. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, this is, so this is the, the, the big question and the big problem I had in writing this book. We have no way of measuring that, you know, it's, it's, I wish there was a, a, a quick, finger stick or a blood test or something to say like, Oh, you're, you have this low grade dehydration. You need a little bit of electrolytes. We don't, we don't, there's no good way of measuring it. So it's, it is trial and error. And once again, like you did a fantastic job, like you're, you know, you are empowered to treat your son and know what to do. And that's a huge deal. A lot of people aren't and don't think of hydration as the first thing to go. They're going to go, Oh, my blood sugar dropped because I just ate a big sugar cookie. Yeah. And therefore I need more sugar in order to get, you know, to feel better. And it becomes a vicious cycle, right. you know? And then you just get more dehydrated because you're not re- replenishing those electrolytes that you, that yes. are all gone now. So exactly. Interesting. And then you wake <laughs> up at 4 a.m. with a splitting headache. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you had mentioned, eat, you know, you encourage people to eat their water because, you know, sort of uh, plant water hydrates better because it sort of mimics the, the water in our cells, which is different than the water we drink. Yeah. So which, of course, I'm alluding to is, you know, what we call structured water or what you refer to as gel water in the book. So let's let's go ahead and dive into that a little bit. So what exactly is structured water? Okay, so this is the whole the true impetus of us writing this book. Um, My co-author had come to me many years ago now, probably four and a half years ago, and started to tell me about the work of Gerald Pollack, who's a water researcher, world renowned water researcher. And um, he discovered that there is a fourth phase of water. And uh, and there, many scientists know that there is another phase of water. Um, we're taking his research specifically because it is a little controversial. It's not controversial. I don't think that there are other phases, another phase of water, but um, the the way that he um, describes the water is maybe a little bit controversial. I don't, I, I think it's very uh, widely accepted now, but, but still. So, Think about that statement. We know that water exists as liquid, ice, and vapor, and now we know that there is another phase of water. It blew my mind. It completely blew my mind. I was like, "What? This simple <laughs> molecule that you know we thought I thought I knew everything about water, H two O, has a different phase, um, and that phase is is gel water or structured water. Um, and basically, what it means is how those water molecules line up um, and layer upon each other and structure." And, um, and it forms this, this gel, Dr. Pollock calls it easy water and that stands for exclusionary zone because, um, when he looked at it in the lab, it, it, um, it basically, uh, um, filters itself. So there's no solutes allowed or no, no toxins, nothing allowed in that easy exclusionary zone. Um, and what makes that exclusionary zone, um, even, even bigger and better is light, which we talked about. Um, and then it also creates, um, energy. It creates electric, electrical energy basically. So it has to do with, um, when those water molecules line up, they share electrons 
Okay, so we know that water is H2O. And when they line up and structure upon each other, these these electrons are being shared. Um, and it is in that sharing that it creates a whole nother um, phase. And that phase is H3O2. Um, and, and those then um, ions are able to be stored and used for energy um, in the body. So, so it's very interesting because we've never really thought about water as energy or making energy energy, but it does, like um, electrical energy, even ATP. Um, so we've always thought that food is what we need to make energy. Um, water is also a source of energy. That's really interesting. Like mm-hmm. that's, this is part of the part that, and I, I tried to read uh, Dr. Pollock's book, uh, Fourth Phase of Water. Uh, I couldn't really get through it because it, it was kind of a uh, complex but uh, so I appreciate your your you know couple chapters on it because yeah you definitely <laughs> simplified it. I'm like oh okay okay you know, something have... like you know the water is activated by you know sort of sunlight or light energy, and then oh what is it the molecules split and then it creates this uh, negative charge and that's you know how it how we can generate. Uh, energy from it electrical energy yeah Yeah. it's funny because when i when i started to do the research too i said to gina i was like oh my goodness what did we get ourselves into (laughs) like because i'm a clinician you know i'm I, i see patients all day long i'm not a researcher and um and it is for the simplest molecule that we thought we knew everything about it is so complex and we're learning new things every day about water. There's a, the, the, there's a water conference every year that Dr. Pollock actually puts on. Hmm. It's happening in October that I'm going to be going to in Germany. Um, and it's, it's fascinating, really fascinating. Yeah. I've, I've started hearing a, a lot about this, um, deuterium depleted water, which yes. is, is, is pretty fascinating too, but that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know the guy who you can talk to. Let me, after we get off, I'll give you his name. Is it uh, is it Dr. Kelman? Is that no, no, nope. nope. somebody else. I have to look up his name. He would, he spoke at my conference at ACAM uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Cool. I'll, I'll, I have to think about it. What his name is. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So back to structured water or, or the gel water. So you said it's kind of, a, it's, we can't see the difference. But we can sort of feel the difference. It's kind of uh, slightly silkier. Uh, so I wonder, like I juice celery every morning. And when I drink it, I'm like, this feels weird, you know. But and I've always attributed to maybe there's like this tiny amount of residual fiber or something. But yeah. is it really the like sort of the, the structured water that I'm tasting and not like the fibrous from the celery? I think so. I, I really do think so. I mean, uh, in, in many cases, you can see the difference. So think about um, how desert plants hydrate. Think about cactus and aloe leaves. You open up those leaves and the gel comes pouring out. Lychee fruit. I don't know if you've ever opened up one of those. They're loaded with gel water. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's literally gel. It's thick, that kind of thing. And then there's, um, you know, the the water from waterfalls. That's charged electrical, you know, that water is really charged. Um, and that, if you took a glass of that water, I don't know if you'd necessarily feel a difference when you drank it, but maybe. So it, it really can run the gambit of, of, um, of what you feel. It's hard to say. So, um, but you know, if you add electrolytes, if you add fiber, some smoothies, green smoothies, that kind of thing, you're structuring your water basically. So are you structuring the water that you're drinking or, or is your body structuring the water after it goes through the, the digestion process? I think both. Hmm. I think, yeah, both. I mean, struct- yeah, you're, 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 by doing green smoothies, that is structured water. It structures itself um, by, um, and then I think your body definitely does stuff to it once it gets in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So th- there's all these like really insanely expensive sort of structured water, you know, filters and, and like whole house systems, and, yeah. like thousands upon thousands of dollars. But um, so f- for us yeah. everyday people, <laughs> yeah. so basically to get more structured water, we need to, we need to do smoothies and, and get those, uh, eat those hydrating foods like the chia seeds, the green vegetables, yeah. And anything else that I'm missing there that would help us get more structured water? Light, sunlight. Light. We want to be exposed to sunlight. We want to move. 
I mean, that's not going to necessarily structure the water, but movement is hydration, which we'll talk about in a second. But I want to mm. go back to something you just said, um, filtering water. Uh, you know, we don't we don't mention any kind of filtering systems in the book. Um, we send people to the environmental working group, ewg.org, where you can find a filter that's suited for your, um, your budget, that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as all the structured water um, devices, uh, I think the jury's still out on them. I do think that there's something to that them, but, but we don't have a whole lot of research behind them just yet. So yes, you want to, by eating your water, by doing green smoothies, by eating more fruits and vegetables and greens, we need greens. Um, you're, you're going to be structuring your water naturally. Now, what kind of a, a effect does, does like a, a carbonation have sort of, so I, I drink a lot of Dr. Zevia, my yeah. guilty pleasure. So it, how bad is that? And is yeah. that really affecting uh, the water that we drink or the water that's in our cells? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think, um, I think the jury's still out on that too. There's no research. Um, I think seltzer, you know, bubbly water, carbonated water. Um, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think is bad for you. There's some people that say like maybe some of the, um, uh, phosphorus and some of those things aren't good. I don't think there's a whole lot of information. Um, but I don't know specifically like Dr. Zevia, I don't know what kind of, um, minerals are in that. If it's just, you know, I don't spark- think there's any. so it's just sparkling water with stevia. Yeah. yeah for, and, and flavors. Yeah. And flavors. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm not sure it's doing a great job of hydrating you. I think the, um, the mineral waters, like the natural mineral carbonated waters are probably a little bit better because there's minerals in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's what I drink Pellegrino. That's, that's like what my, I was going to yeah. say, the Pellegrino. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So that's what I drink. Um, and, uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, definitely sodas need to go because of the other stuff because of all the artificial crap. Yeah, yeah. In them. The, the Coke and Pepsi's and Diet Coke's even worse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I think, uh, carbonated water, I don't think there's, and I, it, it's funny when you wrote that question, I've looked it up before and I hadn't looked it up in a long time. I was like, Oh, is there any new information about it? And I don't see anything. So hmm. interesting. Yeah. So as far as you'd mentioned light energy, can you use like an infrared sauna? Does that help us structure our water? That's the best best way to do it. Yeah. Far infrared is, is by far uh, the best way to um, structure water, detoxify our bodies. There's tons of research that comes out is coming out about infrared saunas and what it's doing um, for detoxification too. It literally pulls heavy metals out of us in, in the sweat. Like you, you know, they've, they've done studies. There's a doctor in Toronto, um, terrible with names. I'm going to blank on his name. Who's done a lot of research on infrared and detoxification, but yes. Uh, and Dr. Pollock did that research when he exposed light to the cells, he found that infrared, um, made structure the water better and, um, more so than, um, any light, but, but truthfully, any light will do. <laughs> Interesting. So what about um, something like using uh, the, the ion cleanse foot bath? Are you familiar with those? I am. Um, it's interesting. I don't, um, I don't ever poo poo anything because I keep an open mind. Um, so I don't, but, but a long time ago I was like, Oh, I don't know about that. And even though I saw the, like the Brown, I was like, I just never understood it. I still don't understand it. Yeah. So I can't, I can't really talk intelligently on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So I bring it up because like one of the reasons, one of the things that like convinced me that it was legit was I was watching a YouTube video of Dr. Klinghart. And he was talking about the ion cleanse and he said he had a conversation with Dr. Pollock and basically Dr. Pollock said something like the ion cleanse and and sort of the, the current that the ion cleanse sends through the body sort of gives the water in your body, like new marching orders is, is what Dr. Klingart said that Dr. Pollock said. Uh, So I was like, okay, so if Dr. Pollock, who was like this world renowned, like expert on water and Dr. Klinghart's endorsing the ion cleanse, there must be something, (laughs) <laughs> with yeah. you know something beneficial like legit about the ion cleanse whether or not i can understand why <laughs> that's a so, whole other story so that's so interesting because you just <laughs> opened up my mind to something really fascinating so i think what dr pollock is probably saying though is he you know i don't know about the detoxification aspect of the ion foot bath but the idea of um 
it sort of likens it to grounding or when we're doing earthing or grounding, when you're walking on, on, on nature's surface and there's an ion exchange, you're, you're literally creating more structured water in your body. You're, you're making the water in your body, so, so to speak, wetter um, or, or, or structuring it. So I think maybe that's, in, that's a very interesting um, idea. I'm going to look into that because I think that that opens up my mind to something very interesting. But you realize that they're saying two different things, you know, so, so Klinghardt is talking about the detoxification of it. And maybe by structuring the water, you're able to detoxify better. I'm not sure. But, um, and then Dr. Pollock is saying that the ions that you're adding in that is literally doing something. There is an ion exchange. And I, I liken that to more um, of that grounding or earthing where you're um, once again, stepping on in nature. Um, and there's some good, interesting research about that too. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. I'll just refer people to, to our, our podcast on, on both. Uh, we had a podcast on the infrared sauna and a podcast on the ion cleanse. So just scroll back a few weeks and, and you should get those. I think they're almost back to back. So oh, I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, so I want to talk to about about salt real fast. Uh, okay. You know, you mentioned salt a lot about adding it to your water and things like that. Yeah. But uh, and you also mentioned balance. So sort of the potassium sodium balance that we need that sort of creates or manages this, you know, cell function basically. But yeah. even like a lot of the healthy salts are mostly sodium. And so if if so if we're just adding higher sodium um, salt. Do we need to do something about adding extra potassium somehow, or is it so? Is the healthy salt sort of naturally balanced with sodium and potassium, or do we need a lot less potassium than we do sodium? Um, you know, once again, there's no great way of measuring these things. Um, they, you know, once we don't have the perfect blood test to know, it, you know, there's I don't I don't think that there's a perfect way of knowing that. Um, I do think that healthier salts like um, Himalayan pink salt, or I love real salt, the one from the salt mines in Utah. We're just learning now that our sea salt may be contaminated with plastics, right? Oh, goodness. So I know, I know. It's uh, so, um, <laughs> but I do think that those real salts, um, the natural salts, are, are very good um, ratio of minerals in them. So, and, and I think it's, it's about using a pinch. It's about feeling, it's about not being cut off by the head, meaning feeling your body, feeling what feels good in your body and knowing that, um, is once again, we have to take control and start, um, living in our skin and, and feeling what feels right for us. I don't have a great way of measuring it. If you have high blood pressure, um, you obviously need to to measure your blood pressure and look at it. Um, I think that whole idea of eating a salt-free diet um, has been reneged mostly. Uh, but once again, if you are suffering from high blood pressure, you're on medication, you need to be a little careful and, and, and look at your blood pressure before you start adding a ton of salt to your diet. Gotcha. Man, we are running out of time and there's so much oh. I wanted to talk about. But uh, so let's let's go ahead and hit on one of the most fascinating parts I found in the book, which is your fascia and yeah. how that is. It's not just sort of, you know, the soft tissue that we can really dismiss <laughs> unless we roll our ankle or something like that. Right. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the sort yeah. of the new discovery and the significance of fascia for hydration. I guess maybe start with what fascia is for those people that don't know it. Okay. Yeah. This was, this was another sort of, um, it's what, it, what is going to sound very, um, common sense. This was mind blowing to me. And, and when I put it into perspective, it's going to be mind blowing to you too. <laughs> um, so we, as you know, medical students, when we, um, dissect cat cadavers, we would always, you know, dissect, you go down to the organ and you throw everything away, you know, so, so fascia is this connective tissue webbing that envelopes every cell, every organ in the body. And when we dissected cadavers, we only, we would throw it away it, or it would be dry, desiccated fascia. We never looked at it. Um, and a few years ago, there was a brilliant French, um, I think he's a plastic surgeon, Dr. Guimberto, who um, 
decided to look at living fascia by putting a camera under the skin of a living person. And, um, and what he's discovered is that fascia is a, um, is a delivery system for hydration. So think about that. This is what was mind blowing to me. We've only ever thought that hydration and fluid gets moved via the blood and lymph. Um, and now we know that fascia literally like a hydraulic pump moves fluid through our body. It also, um, is, is a, a electrical energy. Um, it delivers electrical energy. And I think that we're going to find out that it also delivers, um, nerve energy or neurological energy as well. But, um, so the idea that, that, uh, fascia is a hydraulic pump and I'll, t- I'll tell you the truth, uh, body workers know this better than anybody, you know, so massage therapists, chiropractors, um, any kind of body worker, they know that, that moving that fascia is really healing and, and, and getting that fluid to, uh, to the cells. So the idea of sitting all day, yet another reason why sitting, um, is, uh, uh, the, the new smoking, um, because you're squelching delivery of, hy- of fluid to your periphery. So, um, so that's fascia. That's, that's it in a nutshell. We have to move in order to get that, that fluid to the periphery, to our cells. Um, and the, the common sense thing is like, oh, I've always been told you got to move your joints to lubricate them. Right now we really understand why it's more about fascia, moving fascia. Yeah, and so it's it's not necessarily about like you know running or, or doing any sort of like CrossFit or exercises. You're talking about like just small you know movements throughout the day, which you call micro movements. You actually have like a whole like program right. kind of set up. You know, do this when you wake up, this in the afternoon, this before you go to bed, sort of thing. Yes. Um, do you, do you want to just like give an example of a, of a micro movement, and just so people can sort of visualize what we mean by that? Yes. Um, so bob your head up and down, say yes. That, <laughs> that's a micro movement. <laughs> when you look up to the sky um, and then touch your, touch your chin to your chest, that's a micro movement. So when you think about that, your head is acting like a hydraulic pump. It's pumping fluid into your brain um, and then squeezing it out. Um, so that's, that's what we're talking about. And I just, I want to be clear too, that we, and I think we say this pretty clearly in the book, this is not, um, this is in addition to whatever exercise you're doing. I'm not an exercise specialist, although I did my undergrad degree was in exercise physiology. <laughs> I, I forgot it all. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this is this is in addition to whatever exercise you choose, whether it be high intensity interval training or or marathon running, whatever it may be. Um, this is something that we need to move all day. Um, get out of our seats. Get up. Move around. Stretch. Um, bend your joints. Circle your ankles. That's a micro movement. Um, Twisting is a micro movement, really good micro movement. And I, you know, it's something I thought about the other day. We all now have those cameras in our car so that we don't have to turn around, yeah. to, to, you know, um, and I think that's not good. Right. I think we're, we're, you know, I think a lot of people that was the, the, the most that they would get out of turning <laughs> their head to look out their rear view mirror. I mean, the rear view um, window. So, yeah. It's funny because as I was asking you the question, I started doing ankle rotations under the table here (laughs) it feels good yeah it does whenever i you know i work i do my little uh, just twist and we kind of instinctively do that at you know at our desk where you're like oh i'm getting tired and you start stretching you know sort of thing so it you know totally makes sense yeah yeah we do give you little recipes of things that you should be doing all day long and just try to get into that and you can make up your own micro movement you know this is not rocket science it's really easy it's just literally moving moving all of your joints and getting that fluid and moving that fascia even rubbing your legs is a micro movement Hmm. okay so let's let's sort of give people sort of an overview of uh the plan that you lay out in your book which is called you know simply enough the quench plan yeah Uh, so yeah, just go ahead and give sort of a, a quick overview as we only have five minutes left. Okay. So um, front loading your water we talked about. Um, drinking, and this is, you know, I get a little pushback from this, but I'll, but I'll tell you my reasons. Drinking a glass of water before every meal. Um, people, say, uh, um, people say, oh, is it going to um, lessen my digestive enzymes? Um, 
<laughs> I'm smiling and throwing my hands because that was my very next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely I get a lot of feedback from that. Um, I don't think so. I think when we, you know, if you drink before your meal um, and then you have your food and you chew your food, that's when your digestive enzymes are going to start to to move. And we need that water also to sort of process everything. So I just want to say once again, we're not saying you don't need water. We need some water. Um, you want to get some greens in. Try a, a smoothie or two a day. Basically, I want to define a smoothie too, which is a a blended vegetable with maybe a fruit for sweetener, some um, chia seeds, lemon, ginger, whatever you want to put in your smoothie. It's blended as opposed to juice, where you're getting rid of the fiber. So try try drinking a, a green smoothie a day, um, at incorporating some micro movements, eating a whole food diet. We're very careful about um, the diet plan. We just give ideas for meals because everybody's different and. Um, and not one diet fits all, you know, they're like, again, it can go from anywhere from a vegan to a keto person or an omnivore or a carnivore diet. So it just depends. Um, but that's the plan in a nutshell. Everybody can do this. This is where you need to start. Most people, um, including like my, my healthy yogis will say, wow, I really notice a difference in one or two days. You, you immediately notice a difference. This is something that doesn't take weeks to, to, to master. <laughs> um, but there are ideas that we all need to sort of um, incorporate and it's very easy and it is written for everyone. Yeah. So sort of like the three key elements or principles is, is making sure you absorb the water that, that you're taking in and you get your, a lot of your probably half or so of your water from food and then just make sure you're, you're doing these uh, micro movements throughout the day, you know, early and often and right before bedtime. You got it. Uh, so I want to ask you real fast about sort of the, the, the smoothie thing. I know you said fiber sort of holds on to the water and keeps you hydrated for longer, but um, I interviewed um, Ann Louise Gettleman who recommends juicing because, you know, the fiber sort of slows down or blocks the absorption of polyphenols. So wouldn't juicing be a little more healing than smoothies or sort of is there some way should we be doing both? I think, uh, you know, once again, we're going to get into the nitty gritties of what we're looking to treat. Um, you know, so I think, um, uh, you know, as far as hydration, I think smoothies are the, are, are, are better. Although, you know, there is, there is room for juicing. I also think with juicing, you have to be a little careful because of, you know, if you're juicing just greens and no, no fruits, then, then that's okay. But I think when you're juicing fruits, you're getting a lot of um, sugar. Yeah. So it's, um, it's hard to say. And I think it's also, once again, not one size fits all. I do think um, I like smoothies. I'm, I'm a smoothie fan. So I prefer the blended vegetables. Unless, of course, you have something like SIBO and you can't handle the fiber yet until you treat that. You know? Gotcha. So, not a great answer, but, but unfortunately you can't, you can't, um, make that a vast statement. Yeah. I never, I never juice fruit and, and I'll very, if I do like a, a high sugar vegetable, like a carrot, then I'll only do half of well, yeah. the only exception being like beets. And that's because I just can't stomach the taste of beets and I can drink it a lot better. <laughs> and, you know, and beets are, are very healthy. That's one of yeah. the, the bright colors that I'm able to get down is is from the beets. So, uh, yeah. and then one one more question before I let you sure. go. Well, two more questions before I let sure. you go because we already sort of alluded to the cranberry juice. So I have to ask that. <laughs> so you don't have cranberry juice sort of on your your quench shopping list. You have things yeah. like pomegranate and grape and cherry and and I looked yeah. into those before I was you know picking the cranberry and I'm like, man, this is so much sugar in there. So I, yeah. I'm like, let me get the cranberry instead. So how come, what's your yeah. deal with cranberry, man? <laughs> <laughs> no deal. Actually, that's the first time anybody said it to me. I think we just didn't even think about it. But when you look closely, we're not recommending um, pomegranate, grape, and grape and cherry juice. We're recommending extracts. So, and I think that was more of um, the idea of these beauty waters. They have these concentrated, no sugar, cherry juice uh, extracts um, and the grape extracts. 
I, we didn't even think about cranberry juice. That was the only, the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, no, I don't recommend, you know, grape juice with all the sugar. It's yeah. they're they're the extracts to do these sort of um, what we call beauty waters, which are single ingredient um, waters that are um, really nice for your skin and a little more um, structured than just plain bulk water. Gotcha. Okay. So for the listeners, like we are so barely scratching the surface on all the information that's presented in this book. So like I've, one of my favorite books that I've read since we started the podcast, I feel like I say that every week, but this one was like, I, I couldn't wait to keep reading it. Thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. Thank you for writing <laughs> such a, a easy read and, and, and an informative book. Uh, but before I let you go, Uh, Can you give uh, our listeners three practical tips um, for us parents to raise a happier, healthier family? Oh, good question. Um, I think something, you know, when you push nutrition on your kids, um, they they may not always do what you tell them to do. They may stray when they get into college, but those things that you implant in them when they're kids will always be with them. So even if you think you're not doing the right thing, um, just keep doing it. Cause I think, um, we have to teach our kids about nutrition and, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think you probably know that better than anybody, but, um, but I think that that's important. I know from my own um, experience, like I, we never had fast food growing up. When I went to college, I, I toyed with it a little bit and then I was over it, you know? So I think what we learn as a kid will eventually come back and will always be with us. So, so that's, that's the first thing, um, nutrition, hydration. Um, and what else can I tell you? Um, Hmm. How to raise, <laughs> what was the question again? Tell me it again. How to, how to raise a happier, healthier family. Yeah, I think, um, I, the only thing I could say is just give lots of, this is so basic. Um, lots of love. You just have to, you know, just stand by what you believe in, teach your kids well, and they will always, um, they will always come back to, to what they learned when they were children. I love it. Yeah. I, can't remember who said it or where I read it, but it was like something like your, your quote nagging parent voice will become your, your child's, you know, subconscious voice when they get older. So yes, (laughs) yeah, that just reminded me of that when you said that. And it's so a hundred percent right. Yeah. But, uh, so if you guys want to learn more from Dr. Dana, your website is just drdanacohen.com, right? Yes. Which, of course, I will have a link to in the show notes. And you can find her on, oh, your your socials are a little, one of them is Dr. Dana MD, right? Um, one is Dana Cohen MD, and the others are Dr. Dana Cohen. Gotcha. Yeah. And, of course, again, I'll link to those in the show notes. And, of course, we'll do the, the book Quench in the show notes as well. And I'll go ahead and throw in uh, Gerald Pollux if any of you uh, ultra smart people want to <laughs> dive into that yeah. one. Uh, but, Dr. Dana, thanks so much uh, uh, for joining me. And it was, it was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.